you know, put that on the shelf as a, as a little note to yourself, but you start again at zero every season. So anyways, um, started as a hobby. I grew it from two hives, 50, at 50 is when I discovered that I needed to kind of cut back or pursue this a little, little bit more legitimately, try to see if I can, you know, make my time worth, what, what's my time worth anyways? I can <laughs> figure it, or at least try to justify you know, that my weekends are no longer my own at, at 50 beehives. So anyways, I set out to, to do this full-time, and uh, last year we went, I went into the winter with 500 colonies, and we'll see what we come out into the spring with. Uh, it's amazing. I always feel like Rumble Hills get in some, some springs where you have a heavy winter loss, and you're like, got all these empty boxes trying to draw into gold, essentially. But I'm always continually amazed at how, uh, if you just, how you eat an elephant. It's kind of my mantra with some years of heavy high mortality rate is, one bite at a time. So if you have a lot of boxes to fill with bees, which I sometimes do, then it's one box at a time. The next thing you know, you're reaching for the last box in the in the shed, and it's everything's filled back up again. So um, that's one of the beautiful things I love being about. I love about bees and beekeeping and being you know working in nature is I always underestimate the vigor, the productivity, and that nature only needs a little bit of time to make a, a huge surplus and abundance of something, or it needs only a little bit of time to completely wipe everything out. So there's no, it's, it's, there's a harsh reality on both ends of it, and I think you have to, it really teaches you as a, as a person to, to kind of, you know, take our world we live in, which is kind of the sterile society of whatever, you know, like the internet, and, and then you, and then you can kind of put it back in the scheme of, you know, the ebbs and flows of, you know, the cycles of, of what it is in the beehive, you know, bees, they, they're, they die all the time and they somehow seem to stick all the time too. They're, they're still a species that, is, that we get to play with every year. They're not extinct. <laughs> um, so my whole thing was I wanted to try to, talking to Jeff a few, what is it, a couple months ago now, Jeff? Like a, a good discussion around, you know, everyone can show you like management techniques. You guys can get that from, but I was trying to pick a special spin. One thing I love to think about being a beekeeper is what does it take to be a good beekeeper? And I'm not just talking about, I mean, the, you know, you think of where does your mind go to when you think of good, right? There's a lot of relative notes to what it is to be good, but I'm thinking of the whole embodiment of what it is to be a good beekeeper. Yes, you have bees, you know, maybe you're, as a good beekeeper, you could say, well, you keep, you keep your bees alive, you know? Does that, all good beekeepers lose bees. <laughs> you don't have to be good to, you know, to justify dead bees or whatever. Um, so my intent is to kind of somehow make it, like, are you guys excited to be beekeepers? Yeah. Is there anyone here that just started? And it's just kind of like in an exploratory and intrigue? Okay, welcome aboard. <laughs> we hope we can hook you in here. Um, so, if, yeah, you'll find, like, I, like, again, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. Because bees have, you know, they have, they have stings and they can tell you, you know, you either get over that, your love for, the, for what you're doing with the bees will say, well, you know what, I can't stop. <laughs> Regardless of you know being suited up and getting all sweaty and sometimes getting a you know a bee sting or foregoing the suits and getting stung all day long, um, but regardless, my whole point is to kind of like encourage us, get us excited, um, and to, to think about all the people who have gone before us. If we've been at this a while, think about the people that that were like as a beekeeper or as a young beekeeper just getting started. Those people that kind of like had something that's that was like a your mentor in bees. What made them so special? You know, they seem to possess all the right information at the right time when you call them or when you went over to ask them something in your dire straits and your bees are bearding and you think they're going to swarm and they kind of like remind, remind you that they're just bearding, they haven't swarmed yet. <laughs> or maybe they, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's my whole intent today. And I got some slides I just wanted to share with you guys just, just with what I'm doing. Um, not to get lost in the, the gillyweeds too much. I, so I've been doing this full time since 2010. And uh, in 2010, at the same time, I, you know, I've been, I was raising my own queens all the while. Um, so I've been doing this without treatments uh, since 2010. And I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of flack in the beekeeping community, you know, about you know anyone who would try to make an attempt to do this. I can tell. I want to be honest with you guys. Yes, it's possible to get bees without treatments. Um, we were one of the last niches in agriculture to start to get jump on the paradigm of heavy use and reliance upon chemical inputs. And I think it's silly now that you know people who work so extensively with insects that we just are outright sold. You know that it's the only way now. And if you were to think of any, if your if your thought process is focused on anything else to try to find other solutions, you're you're somehow flawed, and you're gonna you're you're kind of you're minimized uh, amongst other beekeepers. Not 
I'd say that with humility, right? Not everybody thinks this way, but if I, you know, was rubbing shoulders with some other commercial guys who are conventional in every way, I, I, I sometimes just shut up and I don't have much to say other than that I'm still here. <laughs> you know, I, I've been doing this for, since, for almost 10 years now without treatments and I'm still here. Um, and the reality is, is that, uh, you know, whether you treat or you don't treat, it's what's, I, you know, one of the things I think that make up a good beekeeper, and I'll get into later, is what are we thinking for the next generation? How, what is it going to look like? Because um, the reality is, is that the silver bullet, you know, the chemical, the next big, you know, chemistry coming along that's going to wipe out mites, there is none. Right now we're kind of bottlenecked with what we have, so if resistance is built up with what we do have, you know, a lot of conventional guys are going to start, get, they get really nervous. Because what's the biggest thing we're going to get nervous about? We're going to lose all our beats. Well, what do you do when you lose them all? That's what's, what, that, in my opinion, that's what makes a good beekeeper. Or what do you do when you lose most of them? Do you go buy more from someone else, or do you take what you do have and make much with it? Um, that's what makes, in my opinion, what makes a good, someone who can take something they have and then they know how to nurture it, grow it, propagate it, really kind of fill in the voids again with it, instead of just, you know, cut and dry, well, I'll go buy someone else's and fold it back, you know, nothing, again, nothing, the ethics of this, is nothing wrong with that, but what makes a good beat? So, I just, I got some bullet, you know, my own little, to keep my thoughts in line. If you guys have questions, if you want to contribute to anything I'm saying, please, by all means, help out. So I'm interested, would you like to share why you do not treat the bees? Why do you not treat? Okay, so when I, that's a great question. Um, and that, that's a question I think it should be, what, it, what would it take to stop treating? And why would you not want to treat the bees? Right? You could formulate some questions. Um, I decided to not treat because at the time I was, I, like I mentioned, I was raising my own queen bees. And I felt it was extremely difficult for selective purposes how to truly evaluate the, you know, the bees that were building had some, they had some sort of resistance with mites. If I had treated them all in the fall, the previous, you know, August with, with some mite aside, they all were already kind of standing up or propped up. So I had no idea. I mean, you could do all these tests, you know, the hygienic test, but the hygienic, the, the Minnesota hygienic test doesn't test for, you know, it's really just testing for hygienic behavior. Dead brood under a capping. It's not testing for actual paretic or the, the mites under the capping. So you guys understand what I'm talking about? So that's not a good selective measure for mite resistance. And again, so as the years went by, as, as, as I essentially was felt like deep within me that, all right, to truly find good selection amongst queens in my own little apiary, I have to, I just felt like foregoing the whole treatment thing altogether because I was seeing some colonies truly had higher resistance than others in my little, you know, the numbers I had. So I just kind of went cold turkey. That 2000, 2010 was the was the first year, you know, going into the season without using anything. And yeah, I, I won't lie to you guys. The first few seasons it was very hard, going from 10, 12, 15 percent mortality to 50, 55, 60 percent mortality. How do you, you know, that's that's the things that that are that's a hard pill to swallow for any farmer that has livestock and. And how do you how do you justify that? And is the whole genetic component worth that type of loss? Is it worth the pursuit? And is it even real, right? So what made me do this was the fact that I felt that it was worthwhile. And after a few years of thinking, okay, I was losing these, but I still had what I did see is the ones that were surviving were really good. You know, there was something there. Uh, and after a few years of re-propagating the bees and really having a nice breeding program now, because clearly the cream was rising to the top nicely now, right? It's really hard to to, to kind of just just to have a lot of gray area with stuff that's propped up. So, and again, I don't want to fool you guys either. Even without treatments, bees still are dying, right? And uh, it's not like I have some sort of special magic bee. Um, they're just, they're, they're now kind of at, at, the, at the full exposure of, of what the mites are, are doing. They, they're not like, I'm not interfering in a way to kind of buffer mite populations to bees. Bees are now forced to do stuff in combat with mite, or some sort of equilibrium has to, is going to have to be established on their own doing. Kind of like kids, right? You give, them, you give a kid a cookie all the time, they're going to want a cookie. You know, if you say, okay, enough of you, want to, enough of the cookies. You have so many, they kind of learn how to fill in the voids with, you know, without, without so many cookies. Same thing with mites. I think it's, they're a host, they don't want to kill the parasite, the host doesn't want to kill the parasite. And, or the parasite doesn't want to kill the host. So they're, and it's like, you guys remember the Asian honeybee? Most of you guys have been around long enough, you read, you go to YouTube, but all I'm saying is just, it's, it's nothing new, right? You know, the Apis serrana, the Asian, the Asian strain of honeybee that mites came from, there's, they have, you know, they, there is a host parasite relationship that's stable there. So this whole notion that the European strains of bees we play with are somehow, you know, far removed from that is, I think, hogwash. 
I always tell people as beekeepers, we lose, we as people, we lose sight of the time. In 30 years, since we've had mites now, and they're here to stay, since 30, 30 years in our bee population, we have bees that are far stronger today than they were 30 years ago. Does anyone disagree with me in that regards to, in regards to mites? Remember, I, I wasn't here when mites were introduced into the bee population, but is anyone who was? Keeping bees? And do you remember? They just corrupt, they, they, it was devastating. They had no ability to combat or any sort of, they, had, they, just, they just pulled it up and died. And today they're actually, they have so much more resistance. Even the, even the I would say the puppy mill queens, the, the garbage queens that you can get from some people that just have no resistance to mites. They have a little bit more than they started with 30 years ago because they're still alive. Um, you guys, this makes sense to you guys? This is not, it's not rocket science. Uh, go ahead. Well, I know some people who use essential oils. Yep. You know, do you use anything? It's no, not, I, it doesn't have to be black or white. There yeah. are other supported. And I agree, yes. So I, I, I haven't, I haven't yet, to, I have not used anything. And I use, mainly I have numbers that I think a hobby beekeeper wouldn't have. So, and I am encouraging, and I say this humbly too, like, there's nothing wrong with the ethics of using a mite side. Is there anything wrong with it? No, I don't think, I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to, if you're, if, I mean, if it depends on how you're looking at it. But regardless, to keep your bees alive, you got to do what you got to do. And if you don't have the skill set to keep bees alive without the dependence of, you know, incorporating some sort of a mite side to, to treat for mites, then you do, you, you know, you're foolish to think that they're just going to do it all their own. You know, there is a management part of it, too. Um, I always tell people, instead of treating, I'm breeding, I raise my own bees, I raise my own queens, and I rapidly propagate those queens back out into the nucleus colonies every year. If I didn't do that, I'd lose them all. I would be foolish to think that I could just stop treating and, and they're going to magically somehow survive and, and I can just kind of hands-off approach beekeeping. You might be lucky and get a few of them that stick every few years, but I can tell you, you know, if, they, if they're there for five years, you really have something special. <laughs> you have to do something. You have to have management. I always tell people it's a three-part pie. It's, you know, broken into third. It's management, uh, into the environment, and uh, what else was it? Gen genetics. You know, if you can take three of those and play with them together, they make a nice whole as, as a whole. So, anyways, the whole notion of, uh, you know, treatment-free. I have, I have nothing... I, I, I'm always kind of, well, I, it's kind of at the end of my talk. Actually, I'll get to it, it'll finish nicely. So essentially, what does it take to be a good beekeeper? And I can think of, who is a good beekeeper? I just want to kind of roll through some. I wish to, so I always, you know, like to have people come to the apiary and see what I'm doing. I went to visit Kirk Webster before I, I should have known about my, I befriended Kirk and I went to see him, because I, you know, he, he's kind of gone before a lot of people in regards to running an apiary without, without treatments, and I had to go actually see him. Because I, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of people who write books. There's a lot of people who have literature out there, and you go and meet them, and they're they're kind of like, where's what you're writing about, you know? Where is where is you know? Where, it's kind of like they just write, and that's all they do. They're just writers. They have no real practical anything with what they're writing about. So I went to visit Kirk, and I realized this guy's a beekeeper, and he has bees, and they're alive, and he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so I was like, all right, yeah, I got you got my attention. And supposedly, if you haven't treated your bees in so long, then by golly, if you're doing it, there's no reason why I can't at least, you know, again, fail trying to do it myself. So, you know, that's what I did. I, you know, went and worked, I saw his bees, and it just gave me enough motivation to, to, you know, to now just to feel a little bit more confident to say, all right, I can take my, I can take the treatments out and see what happens. Um, so anyways, that's a nice, this is a nice, well, if you guys can see it, but it's a, it's a, I think it's a double or a, a two a two story colony with a honey super with a big cluster in the spring. Um, you know, it's nice to show people that you know you can have an apiary that's very reliable, very resilient, very much you know watch out. The, the potential is there every every season. Last year, you guys remember that you know, 2019 was probably one of the best years for a honey crop for a lot. That's especially if you've been at bee and bees for a long time. It's probably one of the record years. Like. If you, in my case, it's like, will I ever see that again in my lifetime? Because it was such a great year for honey. We harvested, you know, a little over 18,000 pounds of honey. You know, so it's amazing at what, you know, again, and it was re all that, it's amazing to think that all that honey came to be a real reality in like two months, a month and a half. Think of that, right? Because for a little while, I was like, where's the honey? It's not, you know, May was pretty cold and wet. June started off to be a little bit iffy. Next thing you know, it was like a rocket went off and you couldn't stay ahead of them. And it's just like a little well of honey was under every beehive. You couldn't really put enough supers on the fast enough. You know? <laughs> and it just kept coming and coming and coming. So what makes a good who makes and what makes a good beekeeper? Um, I think of my own personal mentors like Kirk, 
uh, guys like Mike. Uh, they're hard workers. They work their butts off. Uh, there's, there's nothing about them that is where they, you know, they're they're where they're pricey, like they're waiting around. <laughs> they're usually kind of proactive, thinking about what's the next thing I need to be doing, especially during the season. You know, and, and, and the, I don't know anybody in agriculture who just kind of well, unless it's you know you're running a hobby farm and it's not in it for much than just kind of whatever. I don't want to get off that, but but uh, regardless, so they're hard workers. Uh, they're they're really kind of open to share their information too with other people. Just there's nothing really proprietary, secret that they gotta hide. I, I always figure if you're gonna try to do anything with bees, it requires a lot of work, and if you're willing to do the you know, what do they say to make a million in agriculture, million dollars in farming, you have to spend two. Yeah. So if you have two million to spend to make one, then do I buy dollar there? I think there's some room in the, there's a big enough pie for everybody to have that, right? Because usually everyone wants, you know, I want to get rich quick, or I want the real quick turnaround on my money. Well, if you're doing that with bees, then you're doing the wrong thing. You know, or you're going to be, you have to, you'll be very lucky uh, if, you, if you succeed in that way. If we have to take passion. Passion for what we do is one thing I think about. Uh, if I didn't like this, then why? I mean, this is the biggest waste of time, and I could be making. If it's about you know, if it's about money, then I could be doing something else far greater. And I tell people, if you look at my the schedule after I submit, you know, the file that I have today, I write every year. And it's like all the money that goes into this, and then a little bit, a few crumbs that I keep for myself. <laughs> and I get people that stop in all the time. They see the you know the building, the truck, and. All the boxes, and they think, you know, geez, you got to be doing really well. It's like, well, if you got if you got a lot of debt, you probably couldn't live on my income, you know. But if you're pretty, you know, if you don't have a lot of overhead, um, my wife and I got three kids, and they're all under the age of three now. So I mean, very brand new kids. So um, that's why you got the right hair, right? For those who have kids that have moved out, I always think this is how I get the right hair, you know, with kids. <laughs> so yeah, we have to, we have to be passionate. Um, beekeeping is kind of a multifaceted thing. It's it's a science. It's a craft. There's you know again it gets 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 philosophical. It, it, it goes into it, you can kind of dive into the whole notion you know with how we work the land and the and the, the ethics of that and the, the nuances of what it is to be you know a human being and live in nature and how we relate to nature and where you know your worldview. Where do we come from? Where are we going? You know and all of this it ties to I mean beekeeping. Is one of those things, you know, because it's so enveloped, bees are tied into everything. It's going to tie you into everything too. If you think that way, I do. I think I'm sometimes thinking the big picture and the little picture, all, you know, all trying to do it all at once. And it's like you just tie your brain in knots sometimes. And it's like I just don't say anything to people because I just don't know what to say anymore. There's just so much wonder sometimes. So um, passionate. We, we've got to love what we do. Like I said, if you're just starting, if you don't love it, by golly, it's coming a lot. It's very expensive now. <laughs> I've been doing this just long enough to, to see how prices have just exploded. And for good reason, too. I mean, bees are sought after, and there's not a lot of them. I mean, it takes a lot of... The overhead for beekeeping is, is huge. I don't know if you guys realize that. Uh, for me, if I look at my expenses every year, it's ridiculous. The cost of gas, the cost of the wood to make the super. I mean, if you're buying your equipment, oh my god. Hmm. You know, 15 bucks for a super, for a deep super? I mean, trust me, I understand what they're... You know, if I was making them, that's all I did was make equipment and sell it. I'd probably want fifteen dollars for it too if I paid a buck thirty, of, you know, or a dollar a board foot and had the machine or the people making the, you know, my shop, the crew, the crew making the supers or whatever. There's a cost incurred in all of it. Um, that's one thing I like. I'm pretty, you know, I'm one of those. I'm in the generation that doesn't understand what it takes to make something. You know, I'm in the generation that has a lot of expectation on that they're worth eighty thousand dollars when they graduate college. And if they don't get a big job, they get angry. And they have a big student debt, and they want to be bailed out of that. It's like, I don't buy into that. <coughs> you know what you're doing. Work hard and pay it off. Regardless, that's a, that's a whole side issue, right? <laughs> so getting into this, I started. I made everything from scratch. Everything was started because I didn't have a lot of money. So I started everything. I made my own equipment. And if I didn't have money, then I didn't get anything. I made, work, made had what I had, I made it work. Uh, so I, I, you come to realize, you know, with, I, I come to realize the value of everything. And I think of other people that do things just as much and work just as hard. It's like, well, I don't want to try to undercut them for what they're doing. Because I know, if I go, if they work from sun up to sundown, I'm going to pay them every little bit that they're asking for. It. I know, you know, and why would I want to, why would I want to deal on something if I feel like I can, you know, if I can reasonably afford it? So again, another rabbit trail. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the, the desire or willingness to share 
to share information with other beekeepers. Um, you know, a lot of, again, like there's, there's a lot of self-proclaimed bee gurus out there. Um, and again, it's nice, it's nice if you can go and visit some of these, your, you know, you're usually someone who's a good beekeeper has, has, is a beekeeper, right? There's, there's an old saying that says there's bee havers and beekeepers. You know, and, and you'll know real quick. My, I always like to say, and, and that if, you, if you're keeping bees for profit, a good beekeeper always has honey every year. That's how you tell someone always. And it's not like you have to pillage the bees of, of honey. You, it's I'm talking about in a bad year. As a good beekeeper, you should be able to have a few beehives that give you some surplus honey. And that's what I've you know just that's the little nuances. Any anybody who has honey continually, and even in the worst of years, is showing that their management and their attention to the details is really something to be considerate of, if, if honey is your thing, not that, you know, that's not the end goal for every new keeper. Um, and then the next thing is, like, again, like the whole aspect of that they're, they're approachable, there's a sense of, well, I like to think that, you know, what makes somebody good or even like a good beekeeper is the idea of, if you've been doing this long enough, you kind of realize you don't have all the answers. Um, and you're, I, it, I know some people get really kind of anchored in their opinions, and they're grounded, they're kind of become almost like the, the concrete solidified around their, their their thought, you know, their foundation of their thoughts, and they're not really quick to, to move around. But the, the aspect of humility, you know, that they're really kind of you, you really have a good sense of who you are and your 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 how small we are in the grand scheme of everything else around us. As the longer I kept these, the more I realized that I that, that there's so much I don't know. And actually, and, and the the idea that we're slow to arrive at conclusions. As beekeepers, I always, I always hear a lot of stuff where, um, well, what kills your bees? Well, the pesticides killed my bees. And again, coming from someone who doesn't treat bees, I'm always one who's considerate of, you know, what's being used in the environment and, and, and thinking of people who are spraying. Is, was that, in fact, did it really kill them? Was that what killed them? Or, you know, another one is, you know, that they absconded and it's October, you know, that my bees absconded before, before winter. It's like, no, they probably died from mites. They didn't know Scott. You know what I mean? Um, so we have to be, what I'm trying to get at is to me, do you really feel like your, your, your feet are firmly planted in, a, in, in knowing the, the solution? And if you really can be honest with yourself and feel like you really don't have all the facts together, don't be too quick to draw a conclusion yet. Um, that's what I, in the beginning of beekeeping, of being a beekeeper, I used to do that. Like, this has got to be what's going on. The longer you keep these, the more you realize that it's multifaceted. And yes, more, stuff, more often than not, you can come to the conclusion. But it's amazing to see someone who has years of experience behind them, they could look at the same thing you're looking at and tell you a, a different story. So it's really nice to see that, okay, wow, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in and around a beehive and knowing how to just be a good observer, just, what's the, what's the term, a diagnostician? You know, to be able to diagnose what you're looking at. Because you have to take in what you're looking at and consider that, wow, there's a lot. You got the world of bees are in, what's going on in the beehive, which is, you know, all the little duties, the little nuances that are being carried out. I mean, there's just so much, there's so many layers. You guys discovered that yet as beekeepers? So many layers to be like, and what's going on in the beehive. Oh, here's one, right? <laughs> Respectful of other beekeepers. <laughs> Say this, because there's some people that you can't reason with, so you just kind of have to kind of keep your distance and realize, you know, they are who they are, and I know my, my, I know my boundaries with them. I know not to get involved in this way, and I know what to expect if I do. I'm just going to get angry and I'm going to want to go and slash your tire or something. <laughs> you know, not that I ever do that, but you know what I mean. There's people in your life that are like that. So again, like, how do I, how do I, how do I, how, do I, how am I above reproach? Right? That's a word that I think is long gone. But how can we, how can we, if someone has, a, if someone make, makes an accusation against me, I'd like to be able to think that I could settle it in a five-minute conversation with them because I really have nothing to hide. And if I do, then by golly, that's a lot of work to carry around and be hiding all that stuff and, and making all these arguments up to just defend my own pride and ego. Um, it's like it's amazing how, how we fight. We become our own best defense lawyers, you know, when we are when we are kind of put up against the wall and someone questions us and, and we're like, well, actually, they're probably right. I just don't want to, you know, I'm just fighting because I just don't want to. It's kind of like our own, what it is to be human again. Like we want to defend our, our whatever it is we're trying to protect. And usually it's our own best interests because we're usually selfish a lot of the time. But regardless, so the whole notion of, you know, should other beekeepers be friendly with them, it's, it's nice. I find that in my relations with other beekeepers, it's, it's really easy because we're all in this together. So it's kind of, you have that kind of sense of camaraderie. 
Uh, but there's a few that I cross paths with that I just don't understand. They're they're like their personalities are like water. They they just take the form of whatever they take shape of whatever you know of like a, whatever container they're in. <laughs> it's like trying to figure them out. Go ahead. <laughs> Leave a watermelon on their doorstep in the middle of the night. Two times in one year, you know, you'll get inside their head for the rest of their lives. Yep, <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> so, um, and that, so that was kind of like, now I got some more of the practical sides of what it is to be a good beekeeper. Uh, prepare for the season ahead, right? You guys are familiar with this. You know, if you're, if you're late making your equipment, if you guys are just getting started, like now is, you could still get, you got some time. If you're waiting until next month, you might find that you're running, you're going to be, you might find, okay, if you're going to make the equipment, it's, you've really got to get making it. If you want to buy it, you've got to paint it, prep it, get your frames made, if you're buying plastic, you don't have to make much, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of prepared, you know, you've got to prepare yourself, so be prepared. Know what you've got to do, what's, ex what, what, what's required before you actually get the bees, um, but a good beekeeper is prepared ahead of the season. I think of, you know, last year was a cold, cold start to the season. We had snow while dandelions were just starting to pop, you know, and, and it was wet. Uh, I remember feeding syrup to bees with dandelions. If it was just warm and sunny, the dandelions would have been there to supply the food, but they weren't, it wasn't happening. You get a few days of forest and then a week of cold rain. So what do they do? They consume all the food and then they start to starve again. So I had to constantly be around, I had dumped lots of syrup and I never fed so much in April before. It's syrup is in particular. Uh, they had enough, it seems like when, the, when they could get out, they could bring in a pollen in, but they just lacked a lot of them. They're starting, the, the, the smaller colonies were lacking in honey or carbohydrates to, to keep everything going. So be prepared for the season. Um, prompt to act. Uh, instead of thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll do it next week. If you think that way in regards, especially if, the, if it's in the middle of the, the, the swarm season or the, if you're trying to, you know, make a crop of honey, if that's your mindset, you probably won't do very well. Your, your bees will always be ahead of you. So, prompt to act based in, in, based on you know the ever changing schedule of nature. You know that how do you when 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 you can see that okay, my bees you know got I got a big cluster of bees that are overwintered. They're gonna you're pretty confident they're gonna come through in the spring. You know once you start seeing pollen coming in and you can figure all right you know 21 days from now the population of this beehive is gonna be very explosive because that's the time it takes from an egg to be, you know, to emerge as an adult bee, and if the queen's laying at that point 800, 500 eggs a day, and about 21 days later, 500, 800 bees gradually are going to be coming online to, to really fill the void. So if you're just going to keep them in two boxes and you do that for too long, you're going to have a swarming issue early in the spring. Or, or you know, if you see that, oh, wow, you know, we got an early spring and the red maples are really in bloom. And where's all this honey coming from? Well, it's coming from your red maples. So put some supers on them or make some, you know, make some splits or do whatever. But, you know, we always have to, as a good beekeeper, you know your flora and fauna, you know your honey, you know your honey flows, you know, uh, usually you're not caught off, too, caught off guard too much. I was caught off guard a little bit last year because we had, for me, up in the, up in, uh, the upper valley, we had, you guys probably saw it here too, but the honey flow, the main flow just kept going. Usually by the 15th of July, after the bass was done, it's, I can like stop putting supers on the bees. It's there, you know, usually my crop is looking at me, I don't really have to go around every, every week and put supers on, but it just didn't stop. It kept going, it was the 15th of July, it was the 20th of July, it was the, I think it kept, it was like the 5th of August, and honey was still coming in. I was like, this is unheard of. Usually by now, I'm like, I'm getting worried. I'm like, what if this doesn't stop? It just goes right into the fall. You know, who would have thought, who, I never thought I'd worry about supering honey. <laughs> it's like, all I was looking for was a break. Because I just couldn't get a break. You know, I almost threw my shoulder out. Because I'm not very tall. These things are getting, you know, I got like six medium supers on these things. And I don't have any more, I got to bring a ladder now. Um, anyway, so that caught me off guard. I, I, I was, again, it was one of those years where, it might have been like the one in a lifetime kind of experience to see that type of a, a crop of honey. Mm -hmm. I hope not, but it was, it was exciting. Can I just ask you, if, if you're going to keep adding supers on yep. and you have an option of doing splits, yep. did you not do splits because you just didn't have the equipment to do splits with? Good point. So I, 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 I designate part of my acre. I, I use a little over 200 colonies that I use exclusively just to harvest honey with. So my whole intent is to, I don't do anything besides let them, you know, put honey on. Um, I have other parts of the apiary where I use to make, because I have some, I, 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 if I, I don't have the time with all the beehives that I have to just make splits right on the spot like that. To answer your question, 
So uh, my whole object is with the numbers that I have is that there's a percentage of the of the apiary that I use to make honey with, so that I can I have a scheme where I just can manipulate I can manage them to make you know just to stay ahead and super them up with honey, and then I have a portion of the apiary that I use to make to make you know to harvest fruit from, and that's what I make up all my splits with there. Because for me to drive around to every little bee yard and take the colonies and take a frame of fruit at every oh my gosh take all day. So if I can go to one spot and every single colony there is just going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, skim off the top every, you know, I'm going to take the surplus brood, if you want to call it that, the brood that's like going to cause them to swarm. I just harvest brood every every week. This is, this is a tactic that's not new, right? It's just like, it's might, maybe for some of you, but it's nice because I can go to one apiary and make all my splits here on a given day and then everything kind of falls because it's a very hectic schedule. With queen rearing, uh, it's an eight day schedule. Um, so there's like two days out of the eight day schedule that I can get away to super my other colony, the 200 plus colonies that I have to, to, to honey. Um, and then the other, so it, anyways, it's pretty intense throughout the summer. It gets, it gets, there's like five million balls that are being juggled. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, see, I couldn't do six. So. Yeah, and that's, yeah, you're doing this on a small scale, you don't have to let them get that tall. But see, for me, I, I don't have time to, for me to harvest the crop. To even get my equipment set up, I have pictures if we ever get around them. I, I have to have at least like 50 supers to be even justify starting up extracting because I have this, you know, I have a clarifier and a pump and I got to put it in the bulk tank. So to just to have a few supers to run through the extractor just dirties everything up and it's a waste of time. So to get a big crop behind you, it just it's like sugaring. Some of you guys that are in the, you know make that are sugaring, you got a big arch. You don't really just boil a little bit of sap. You need to get a supply. You got to get it in front of it, right? Stay ahead of it. So it's the same way with extracting honey. With given your operation, I need I can't just extract you know two supers of honey. It would be unless I had if I bought a little hobby extractor. I could sometimes I wish I had one just for the sake of you know. It'd be kind of, you know, just to, hey, kids, come over here and track this one. <laughs> but uh, regardless, kind of move through some pictures a little bit. This is a, I, if you guys can't see this, I, so I have little baby combs, the, the mini nukes that better be, actually Mike Palmer, Kirk Webster uses. Um, I, if you, it's, it's suggested if you raise over 300 queens in a season, that these baby combs are, are great. So this is what they look like coming out of the winter sometimes. It's like, they're just boiling with bees. Did you guys, did most of you, most of you guys who have bees or have bees, did, la did you guys have a good winter last year? A lot of bees come through the winter in good, good shape. I found it was like I had I had under twenty percent mortality. It was I was I was, I had to tell people without being that I haven't used treatments, 35, 30 percent mortality is a great number because I have enough empty equipment to stay ahead of the ones that are alive. And and you know having twenty percent, I almost I was like running, I almost ran out of equipment because everything's so strong and it's going to swarm and everything's on now foundation because I usually have a lot of drawn comb to play with. So again, it's good problems, but it's nice. Some people that are in this, you know, for profit, you know, professional beekeepers, and I tell them I need 35% mortality and I tell them it's a nice number, they, they, their jaw drops and they think it's just the most ridiculous thing because that's unacceptable to them. Well, it's relative, right? And I always say it's like, it depends on how hungry you are. If you're, some people will do some things that if you're if you're really hungry, you're more motivated to do some things that you normally wouldn't do if you're kind of fat and happy. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's really kind of an idea of how motivated you are to, to make things work. Just going to go through queen cells. Uh, that's kind of like the backbone of my whole apiary is breeding queens and then propagating them back into the apiary. Um, different kind of those are some queen cells that aren't fully capped yet. Those are, this is a picture of a four-way mating nuke. And it's just a deep super again divided into quarter sections. This is what one of them looks like going into the winter. I love to winter them sometimes just like this. The trick is every quarter section has to look like this, though. So